Uh, but I will ask uh, Ms Dowdy if, if she would like to just comment in relation to it, because the inference which Mr Corsier draws is not an inference supported on the, on the document, even on its face. Ms Dowdy. Thank you very much. Um, we can confirm that the projections as submitted to you are excluding those online student numbers. So uh, for a little bit more amplification, um, we have a strategy to develop our online provision, but that doesn't take away the forecast growth in the on-campus provision. It's entirely separate. Thank you, sir. Indeed, as, as I said to you myself, that, that, that was already taken into account when we looked at the figures. I'm sorry, in agreement. <laughs> And, and since Mr. Elvin raised an issue of safeguarded land, can I just throw into the mix? I'm not entirely sure why I've turned into somewhere else. Um, yeah, I, I, our case is firmly based upon paragraph 143E on our evidence, your form of view one way or the other in relation to that. But certainly we, we think that there is a difficulty in the authority's position based upon what we've put forward. Um, that we think there is clear evidence that, that the boundaries would need to be altered at the end of the plan period were land not safeguarded. If our land isn't needed by the end of the plan period, it won't be released. But if it is needed, then necessarily there would be an alteration of the Greenbelt boundary, uh, particularly if VSC had to be demonstrated. But that's a point that we've articulated now, and I suspect you have that point now, sirs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Tucker. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to move it on. Um, Councillor Waters, I think, is next. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Um, sincere apologies for this, because uh, I'd just like to take you back about three hours um, to when Mr Elvin presented the Statement of Common Ground. Um, he did refer to the significant change, which was the removal of the 23% footprint um, limitation on development. Now. I can understand if that's a change in policy, um, but as far as uh, Eslitton East is concerned, that was a planning condition from 2007. Um, I assume, therefore, that there'll have to be some form of Section 73 application to, to vary that planning commission condition. Um, I'm quite happy to be corrected if I'm wrong. I have a specific reason for asking this, which will become clear later. Nobody contradicting me, so I'll, I'll, I'll carry on. No, in, it, so I'm happy to. Mr but, Tucker, so, go on. What yeah. do you think about that? It, it, it doesn't affect the permission at all. There's no need for a Section 73 application. The permission stands as a freestanding consent. This is a policy change to deal with prospective uh, consents that may be granted in relation to Heslington East or West. Mr Tucker's avoided me having to say it, so I agree. The reason I asked that will become clear shortly. Um, I, I listened um, to Mr Elvin saying that this would remove uh, an artificial constraint on development. I then listened to Mr Keyes saying that um, this would make the university work their current estate harder. Now, if all this happens, um, and yet yeah, I'm fully in support of it, I'd like to see a significant increase on um, on-campus development for various things, specifically student accommodation. Um, I just wondered what calculations had been done in terms of percentages, if it went up to a 40% developed level or a 50% developed level, um, how that would sit with ST27 and the safeguarded land. Um, it seems to be quite open-ended at the moment. Um, my worry would be if the university was allowed to work its current estate harder, it would probably um, choose the option of more business-related development rather than working the estate for the benefit of surrounding communities, which would see more accommodation put on the campus and the thorny question of car parking. Because if the estate is worked harder, if that developed footprint goes up to, say, 40%, then you could rightly assume that there would be more traffic associated with that 
site. And as part of those planning conditions in 2007, um, the parking's limited to 1,500 spaces. Obviously, that car parking would have to rise as a percentage figure in, in tandem with um, this footprint limit being reduced. Um, the reason I asked about a Section 73 application in relation to that was because every time I ask whether anybody's going to address the problem of the displaced parking, which is dumped in surrounding residential areas, that everybody washes their hands of, uh, there's no appetite from the university or the council to pursue that um, line with the car parking condition. So I, I just wonder whether anybody could enlighten us to, the, to this business of removing that limit. It seems to be rather open-ended with um, no defined benefits to as I say, the surrounding residential communities that have long argued for more development on campus. If, well, what, what I took from the, from the conversation we had earlier on was that you take the 23% you take the limitation away um, in a policy, anything that then comes forward is considered um, on its merits so if there are uh, consequent impacts of working the existing estate harder um, and, you know, perhaps there are objections about car parking being displaced, well, that would be something that would have to be considered when an application is before the council, considered against that, that policy. So rather than, than having a, something set in stone, you know, thou shalt not develop more than 23%, you, you, leave, it, you leave it to to the council and the, and the applicant to have more discretion about how that's done and thought about. It's not that those matters wouldn't be taken into account, of course they would be, but they'd be taken into account through a policy that's worded slightly different, differently without that limitation. That's my understanding. I, I hope I'm representing that properly. That, 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 that's right, sir. I mean, all of the factors, I understand Council Waters' concerns, all those factors are written into the policies. Though There will have to be case-by-case -case judgments but taken with a development brief for the whole of the campus. Um, so, I mean, just, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> uh, we're not suggesting that those uh, issues shouldn't be addressed, but they need to be addressed without an artificial constraint. Um, they are written in uh, the need for student accommodation, the uh, identification of transport impacts, the management of them, sustainable transport methods. All of those factors are all factors that have been written into the policies. Does that help, Councillor Waters? No, in a word. Um, York University, I think, is about a year older than me. Um, and I've, I've watched it all my life. Um, we get into the early 1980s, and it's, university's there, it's benign impacts on local communities, benign impacts on the rest of York. We have had 40 years now of unrestrained, unrestricted growth of that organisation. And as we've sat here this morning, as was pointed out by Heslitton Parish Council, there was no reference whatsoever in any of this as to the surrounding communities. And I don't honestly think that opening up this 23% footprint limit without being a bit more prescriptive as to what the increased usage or working the estate harder actually means is going to benefit the communities surrounding the university. Because I see it just being exploited for more business use rather than putting more accommodation on the site. So I'm sorry, it doesn't really help me in that respect, Inspector. The other thing, while I've got the floor, which I found deeply worrying this morning, was when we heard the university saying that um, this expansion's not going to stop when we get to the end of the plan period. I, I was hoping that, you know, if ST set 27 was given up, 
that would be the end of it. I was hoping that there'd be a light at the end of the tunnel, at the end of this plan period, for the communities that live around the university, that would say enough was enough. But that doesn't seem to be the case from what we've heard this morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councillor Waters. Um, Mr Tucker, should I come to you first, Mr Elvin? I don't think it's, I've got anything else to okay. say. Yeah, mine was Mr. a legacy Tucker. tell, I'm so sorry, sir. Was there anything you wanted to say in, in response? Uh, no, sir, nothing. Uh, my my tow drone was up um, okay. because I've forgotten to put it down. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry. I'm, I'm confused. My fault. Well, thank you. Thank you, then, Count Councillor Waters. Let's, let's move along. Uh, Mr Merritt, is your, is your nameplate on end? And then I'll come, I'll come to Ms Hilton after that. Yes. Uh, um. <laughs> It's a little unclear. I mean, originally this was to be the people who were objecting to the site allocation at all, but we seem to have drifted further. So the to sort of put all our things on the table, I, I hope, at this point. Um, York Labour Party uh, is very supportive of uh, the university's uh, growth. Uh, it, we see it as absolutely vital uh, to the economic future of this city, uh, the growth of uh, you know, learning-related jobs certainly seems to be uh, absolutely the way to go. So it is important that we find ways of accommodating the university's needs effectively. But that must not be done at the expense of other important issues for the city, such as its housing supply, such as its green spaces, uh, and so on. Um, in, the long, in the longer term, we believe that there will be uh, uh, future needs to be accommodated, and we uh, share the university's concern about the lack of safeguarded land at the end of the planned period, without necessarily uh, supporting their specific suggestion of where that should be. Uh, we, we, you will see from our original submissions that we recognised this was a potential issue, and we saw the site ST15, as it was uh, originally proposed, just uh, fairly near on the other side of the A64, as one way of meeting that. Uh, in, in our uh, representations, again, we were very much trying to defend the existing jobs on the Fulford Barracks. Uh, that obviously remains our position. That's 1,500 very valuable jobs for the York economy that maintains a diverse economic base for the city. But I think we'd acknowledge, if we aren't at the end of the day able to prevent those job losses from, from the city, then that uh, has the potential for providing alternate uh, employment and potentially some uh, university uses that are in reasonable walking distance of the existing West uh, Campus. Um, I'll just briefly, as it, as it came up in some of the earlier discussions, uh, touch again on the issues that we discussed last week re regarding the 1.5% assumed growth in the plan period. As, as I pointed out, uh, there's actually been a 36% increase in student numbers against the figures quoted in the original plan evidence base uh, from 2016 to 2020. And in fact, there appears, uh, which is about 9% per annum growth over that period. Uh, and if you look at the latest current year's figures, uh, there's been about another 4% growth in a single year. So uh, we, we remain uh, very concerned as to whether the uh, now suggested 1.5 to 2% uh, figure is realistic and uh, unsound, not just in terms of going ahead, but uh, obviously uh, in terms of what's already happened, and suggests that in terms of the assumptions in the plan, there either needs to be a much higher figure taking account of what has already happened, uh, or, uh, in effect, there needs to be a split figure 
if 1.5 to 2 per cent is a reasonable assessment of, of the position from here forward, then you have to acknowledge that there's been a much higher percentage growth in the first few years of the plan, which needs to be reflected in how we address housing need and, and, and other issues. But uh, as I say, given, given what's happened, uh, whether 1.5 to 2 per cent, such a narrow band is reasonable, I, I think is very much open to question. The impacts of the expansion of student numbers, as, as we've argued in previous phases of the hearings, it, it has been massive. You know, the university's housing, gen the, needs, the housing needs the university generates is frankly the biggest single factor influencing the housing needs in this plan. Um, since obviously the last phase, the council has propo uh, proposed some amendments uh, to the plan uh, in terms of student housing, but also affordable housing, which has been our other big concern. Um, and, but we are, whilst welcoming uh, the new commitments in principle, uh, we actually don't think the wording of the policies will mean that actually those headline changes are delivered in practice because the, uh, the actual changes are so weak uh, in terms of their wording, as we've argued in our written submission. hope the inspectors will look at that very carefully, because I think we've given you some very good uh, uh, reasons and a case for why things need to be modified further. If these changes to the plan are going to go out as a set of major modifications for further consultation, we would hope uh, that the council and, and the inspectors would support some further modifications of the wording as we've suggested in our written submission to actually, uh, so that there is a robust delivery mechanism uh, for those changes, which there isn't at the moment. Um, I mean, those, the, those pressures on the housing market continue. Last week's press reported the latest monthly housing figures uh, which showed a £4,000 rise in the price of York housing in a single month and showing a 20% increase in house prices uh, on a year before. So, you know, th th these housing pressures are extreme. So that's why it is so important we try and get these, uh, th that aspect of the plan right. But it doesn't just impact the local housing market it impacts employment in this city. We know that the university is having significant difficulties recruiting staff, support staff, but also teaching staff, because the house prices in this city are now so high that even on a lecturer's salary, it's actually very difficult to afford to live in this city. So you end up with large numbers of uh, teaching staff at the university actually having to live elsewhere in the region, as I quoted uh, in the previous phase, as far north as uh, Middlesbrough, uh, and having to commute vast distances uh, to, to actually come here to teach. So that, that is not an acceptable position, and it will constrain and negatively impact the university's wish to continue to uh, expand, and in particular, its ability to uh, help deliver those important projects like by Yorkshire and so on that it is hoping, uh, it is hoping to help make happen. Um, so, you know, that, that is why we cannot ignore the university's impact on the local housing market and why it is important that there is a, a much more generous approach on it. If I could then, uh, hopefully having made that case, move on to um, some other aspects of what we are faced with here. We are very concerned at the complete abandonment of the 23% guideline. We did, as we made clear in our written submission, feel there was room for some flexibility on it, but we are, are not convinced that the new policy wording is robust enough to that. I think we'd, what we'd anticipated was something more along the, along the lines 
of changing it from an absolute 23% to something that specifies, say, around 23% or around a quarter, because I, I think that would mean the policy was strong enough to maintain what is the essential character uh, of both the West Campus, but also the new East Campus uh, and the important uh, uh, development there. Th those green spaces in the existing university are very important, not just for the university's character and its attractiveness uh, as a place to come and study, a place to come and research. They're also important for the surrounding communities. Lots of residents uh, you know, head up to the university for a wander around on a, on a weekend uh, and holidays and so on. Uh, you know, they are a vital part of the city in, in that respect too. And it is important that the openness, the space and the character are, are maintained. Another uh, concerning development in the latest set of changes is also the abandonment of the parking limits. Uh, that, uh, that have been crossed out in the, in the new policy. They, they have been absolutely fundamental to uh, both the character of the campuses in terms of being relatively car free and parking on the periphery, but more particularly in terms of their imp the university's expansion's impact on the traffic network in the city. The, the rationale for those parking limits was on the base, you know, in the East Campus extension, was because the traffic analyses at the time showed that uh, if the university had been allowed to increase its car parking and car access uh, significantly, it would have had major detrimental impacts on the local highways network. The uh, link through to uh, Hesling, to, uh, to, to, to Fulford Road, uh, to, to the west, uh, would have overloaded that junction, which is already quite busy at, uh, at, at peak hours, and would also have potentially at that point tipped over the, uh, the junction uh, into an air quality uh, management area because the pollution uh, at that junction was also very near the limit uh, at the particular time. But it also has major impacts potentially on Town Hall, uh, in terms of uh, 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 if, you, if you allow the limit to be scrapped uh, and generating additional traffic uh, through Tang Hall, uh, Tang Hall Lane, Melrose Gate and so on, uh, and neg very negatively impacting the communities to the north. So uh, we, we consider it is vital that you maintain uh, the parking limits on the existing campus and if there is more generous parking on the new ST27 site, then that should not have a through traffic route to the north. It should only be to that proposed link road uh, to, to the A64. Um, the other aspect that needs addressing is obviously because of the tight parking policies, there uh, is potential spillover parking into surrounding communities. The Campus East uh, extension was required to, uh, in effect, pay for the introduction and the funding for a number of years of residence parking schemes in, in Badger Hill and beyond on the basis of parking counts that would take, that, that, that would take place annually. Um, that is an important provision that needs to be maintained. It is very clear uh, that those res park schemes are essential uh, and we feel that actually residents should not be expected to pay for those at the end of the uh, period uh, that was specified in the original planning permission. But you will actually also need to uh, extend that in terms of the ST27 uh, development so that we uh, do not exacerbate the position further with the, with the new development. So I think those were the main points I wanted to uh, make. Uh, at this point, thank you. Yes, I think matters such as the this, this, the CPZs or the control parking zones are probably more matters for any subsequent applications that come in rather than the rather than the plan. But I, I take your point about um, parking if, parking limits and understand that. If, if there is a hook 
in the policies, or at least the supporting text that indicates what is likely to be expected. It makes it so much easier uh, when those planning applications come in. The detail can be sorted then. Yes, Dan. Thank you. Yes, can I, can I hear from you, Ms Hilton? Oh, Ms Hilton and then we'll break for lunch. I'm, I'm getting the call. <laughs> Thank you. Go on. McDonald's obviously uh, is exerting its siren call to Mr. Barclay. I'll try and heat things up a bit. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Low Lane, which is the lane at the southern boundary of Campus East, uh, and also Green Lane, which is a, a bridleway which adjoins Low Lane. Um, these are footpaths and a, and a country lane which are very important to. Um, the local residents, and the land that the lanes and bridleways go through, they're not, it's not a vacant plot. And the way that the um, Statement of Common Ground and the, and the university um, hearing statements have been presented is as if this is just empty land that has got no purpose, and they're coming along to, to fill it with a new purpose. But actually, it's productive farmland. It's producing local food and is also providing local employment. Low Lane itself is a no-through road. It doesn't link into Campus East at all at the moment. And that was all part of the plan from 2007. The fact that it is a no-through road protects it from becoming desirable vehicular acts of desirable vehicular road and preserves it as an example of a proper country lane. <clears throat> it's unlit. It's got hedgerows down both sides. It's got farming activity on both sides. <clears throat> Excuse me. Any loss, or loss of low lane or change to it um, would be a, a source of great grief for local residents. And in, indeed, the university staff and students use Low Lane as well for recreation um, and as, as one of the amenities of, of the campus. The link road that was mentioned by Mr Corsier from the grade separated junction is, is a huge threat to Low Lane and, and again to the village. Un unfortunately, the, the whole of the proposition of the grade separated junction, the link roads to Campus East and uh, in through to York, has not undergone the normal six week public consultation because it came out as a statement of common ground. So we're slightly kind of playing catch up with what, what the implications of all these huge, huge developments are. But they're certainly the, the grade separated junction on the A64 in particular would have a massive implication for Heslington and the link road right through the green belt. Um, Mr. Merritt has suggested that there shouldn't be any access to ST27 from the north, but if my geography is right, the north of ST27 is campus east. So I can't see how it is possible to have ST27, which obviously we think should not happen. Not, I'm not wanting to say anything implying I agree with ST27 because we absolutely don't. But you certainly couldn't have all the car access to it along Low Lane or along whatever the supposed link road is, which nobody really knows exactly what it is or where it is. Um, I just wanted to pick up very, very quickly, before we have lunch, um, on the supposed safeguarded extension that the University of York is um, proposing. Because in uh, Mrs O'Neill's hearing statement, and I think it is document three of her statements, there's quite a long list of her statements, document three, um, questions 2.24 to 2.10. Um, paragraph 125. Now, um, I've learned an awful lot about Greenbelt law in the last couple of weeks, as, as we know. Um, but Mrs O'Neill says, 
The green belt boundaries proposed around extension site ST27 are not justified as they are not based on up-to-date evidence on the development needs of the university. Now, I'm not an expert, but I didn't know that the development needs of anyone or anything or any institution was a, a green belt purpose. So I'm just querying that statement. Okay. I read that statement of meaning in, in the context of examining a plan, um, in the context of what we're doing here. The needs of the university need to be taken into account when setting a green belt boundary. That's how I, that's how I read that. But I understand the point you make. I am, I am going to break for lunch now. Um, We'll, we'll resume at um, two o'clock um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll continue the discussion. I can see there's still some, some name plates up. Uh, and um, yeah, two o'clock. Until then, thanks everyone. Mm -hmm.